but speaking about buying or selling or waiting or whatever, you're the silver chartist, and I almost always fail to ask you technical questions directly about the charts <laughs> because it's um it's not something that I'm too good at, um, not good at it at all, by the way. But so I was thinking, let's just maybe open up a, a silver chart here, and uh, maybe you can walk me through what you see in the silver chart right now. What do you expect to see in terms of uh, you know patterns, formations, indicators, or uh, whatever else that might be? Is that okay? Yeah, you bet. It looks like you'll have to enable me to share my screen again. Sure. Yeah, let me do that. Yeah. So, so whenever I, I look at a chart, I, I like to start big to small um, before I start looking at the smaller time frames. And I'll keep this pretty brief, but this is a longer term chart for silver, and it can kind of tell you where we are in the big picture. And you know, you can look at this chart and say, well, yeah, we're in a bull market, and we're still in the early stages of a bull market. Um, it, so I see this big rounded bottom with this false breakout here in March and April of last year. And then we've got this little triangle pattern. These are monthly candlesticks, by the way. Hmm. And uh, we've got a you know what couple days here left in the month. So when I zero in on this candle, what I really want to see is a long wick below uh, the support. So if we close back up within this pattern, now the technical damage will be minimal as opposed to closing down here. If we close below this uh, triangle pattern, that increases the likelihood that we're going to dip down towards the next support level, which is uh, 2375. So I, I like to keep my charts very simple. I mean, a lot of people put tons of indicators and um, just uh, the, the, the charts are very, um, you know, hard to discern. I, I like to just use uh, two moving averages, a 200-day moving average, a 50-day moving average, and then a simple horizontal support and resistance with the RSI up there. So you can see the low yesterday was 24.51, but the next big support down here is 23.75. So um, if we close the month out of that triangle pattern, I think it's very likely we come back and back test 2375. Um, I deal in probabilities, not predictions. So I think there's probably about a 50 50 chance we, we pull back to 2375. And then I think it's a further outside possibility that we pull back towards 22. You can see this little double bottom here uh, going back to 2020. And then when you pair that with the commitment of trader support, um, you can see this is updated uh, last Tuesday. So it's you know over a week old now. But you know, we're, we're not. This bar shows that we're, it's still pretty long. The commercial shorts are, they still have a pretty large commercial short position. Um, so they stand to benefit from a lower price. That's worthy of note. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. And you're right. That's the uh, first thing I noticed um, about you first time we spoke is that you have a very simple approach to technical and just analysis in general. I mean, even if I could follow along, as I said, this is indeed simple enough and um, I'm liking it. And uh, great. Well, you know what though we're looking well what we were looking on that chart was was the paper price of silver and that's important to um distinguish i think because i'm i'm also thinking about physical silver and specifically about the premiums on that and um and also how you, how one may want to use that because again i'm going to mention bob moriarty here because i've been reading his book recently mm -hmm. uh, i had a couple of great conversations with him as well he told me to read a few of his books so i did and uh in one of those books, he's speaking about looking at the Sprott Physical Trust, which um, it, it, I find it one of the best ways to invest in physical silver. If you don't want to hold it in your hand, still mm -hmm. buying the physical is the best thing, obviously. Sure. Um, but at least, you know, Sprott's going to have the actual physical silver. But what, Bob's talk, uh, what Bob talks about is um, looking at that, looking at the charts on that trust and more specifically looking at the premiums or discounts to NAV to mm -hmm. sort of find an entry or an exit point to silver. So um, as a silver charger, Steve, do, do you ever look at those charts or do you ever look at premiums on physical silver? I sure do. I, absolutely. I, uh, at times like this where things are oversold and then they, it gets smashed down lower, often um, f for every percent drop in the paper price, the premiums rise by at least a percent or two. And I think we're probably close to that now. So you know, let's say that the price of silver did drop to 22. Um, it's about $2.50 lower than now. I bet the premiums would rise by almost the same amount. Um, so that, that's kind of what happens at these near major market bottoms. The premiums always go up on the physical. And, uh, you know, I also track the premium to net as asset value on the PSLV. And at times of big demand or when prices really smack down, you, know, you can see a five, six, seven percent premium on that PSLV. Yeah, I guess Bob... Um you know, gave the example of uh, back in 2011, that premium got up to 30%. Mm -hmm. um, 
so that he calls it, you know, the, a crazy situation in the market because why would a person want to pay, you know, thirty percent premium to own um, paper silver? Essentially, what that's what that is. And uh, I mean, in 2011, he called it apparently, I wasn't there, obviously, but he called it uh, very well. But what you said is also very interesting to me. Like, why, why would the premiums rise if the paper price is dropping? Is it because people who stack physical silver want to buy more when the price is lower? Yes, that's exactly it. Um, silver investors tend to be contrarian investors and physical demand goes up. Retail investment demand goes up when the price falls. And it, it's crazy. It's a b bizarre market. Like here's the ultimate example. February 1st was the big silver squeeze day, right? So um, that was a day, as far as I know, that was like the day that there was record demand for physical silver, right? And uh, everyone wanted it. There's, it's not like there's all of a sudden this new supply. Supply is actually, you know, if anything, it's decreasing. And the price fell. So like in what market can you see the price fall when demand is increasing and supply is at least stable or falling? Um, and that's the silver market. So the, 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 that's when the premiums go up on physical. And that's where you kind of have to discount the, where the paper price becomes increasingly less meaningful. I'm thinking when it comes down to selling, when it comes time to selling. So, you know, when it comes down to, to, to sell silver and buy yourself that farm with the chickens yep. and, and hopefully a few ducks. <laughs> I, I hear their egg, eggs, duck eggs are rising in price. So maybe an interesting hmm. commodity. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, when it comes down to, when it comes time to sell, what indicators are you going to be looking at to start scaling out, Steve? Yeah, for me, so I, I've got a large allocation to this sector, uh, probably more than is, um, you know, uh, wise for most people. Um, so I'm going to, I plan to sell a little bit too early. So as we approach 50 bucks, I'm going to take some off the table and go put that somewhere else. But then after that, I'm going to hold most of it because I do think silver is likely to go to $300 an ounce in the fullness of time. And that may sound sensational now, but I'm talking, you know, over the next handful of years. So I, I think the dollar is going to become an incre increasingly less reliable unit of account. So measuring things in dollars doesn't make as much sense to me for my exit strategy. Instead, I'm going to use ratios. So for example, uh, the Dow gold ratio typically reaches one to one at the peak of a bull market. 1980, the Dow bottomed at 850. Gold peaked at 850. There's your one to one ratio. Something very similar in, around 1933, if memory serves me correctly. Um, so that's one ratio to look at. Another one is a silver to real estate ratio. If I can trade a thousand ounces of silver for the median U.S. priced home, that's a pretty good indicator that you're nearing a top. So I'm, with both of these kind of ratios, and I have other ratios too, I'm not going to try and like nail the bottom, but say the Dow Gold ratio gets to three to one. Well, that, that might be time to start scaling out and then keep it just a little bit for if and when it reaches that one-to-one -one ratio. So I, I like to, all that to say, I like to use ratios for my long-term exit strategy. That's, uh, that's very cool because I've been exploring different ways to work with ratios. And I'm just going to look at some of the ratios on here. Maybe um, talk to you about it. Maybe you can tell me which one of the, which of those ratios you like. Um, so what I relate silver to is obviously I got the gold to silver ratio. But then mm -hmm. I have the um, GDP to silver ratio. And then I also have the total market cap of uh, mm -hmm. all listed equities to silver ratio. A funny one always to look at is the Fed's balance sheet to silver ratio, because that right yep. now is showing me a price of over $850 if we get, yep. to, if we get to that um, all-time high of that ratio. And then I have uh, obviously oil, copper, uh, and all that to silver ratio. As you said, the average home to silver ratio, and how many ounces of silver does it take to buy the average home? And an interesting one that I've recently added is the M3 money supply. So the broad hmm. money supply uh, to silver. So well, which, one of those which of those ratios do you think are, are good to use? Well, all, all of them, really. I mean, they, they all kind of paint. I, I wouldn't use one in unison, but you, know, you put them all together and they kind of paint a, a nicer picture. Um, that's actually maybe more ratios than I use. Um, I, I've got about 10 that I track. Hmm. Um, also, silver Dow is, is interesting. So like right now... Um, the silver Dow ratio is about 100 to one, if memory serves me correctly. And, you know, in 1980, that peaked at about 20 to one. So that means silver would outperform the Dow by a factor of 50, just to return to that ratio. And that's the metal itself, let alone the mining stocks. Yeah, great, great points, man. I mean, I, I really like your style. It's um, simple, simple enough. And um, although I cannot confirm whether it works or not, it, it sounds to me like it should. Sure. And, um, but when it comes down to that technical analysis, what tips would you have for me as an inexperienced precious metals investor if I wanted to start relying more on technical analysis? What, what tips do you have for me, Steve? Uh, well, in general, I would say keep it simple. 
um, minimize the indicators, uh, p- pick three or four go-to patterns that like your eyes go to. So like, I, I like triangle patterns, triangle patterns are very powerful. You know, it could be a rising wedge, descending wedge. And, um, you know, d- don't try and be a master of everything. You know, like there's people who do Elliott wave. Um, there's people who, there's hundreds of indicators out there. Pick two or three that you like two or three patterns. And I would say always put for me personally on a daily chart, I always use the 50 day moving average and the 200 day moving average. Cause those are very widely used inputs to these big trading algorithms that drive the paper markets. So yeah. those are just some general pointers. Nice. Yeah, no, those are definitely helpful. I guess the, the main reason why technical analysis works and when technical analysis works Mm -hmm. is when you're using indicators and patterns that other people are also looking at and Mm -hmm. are using as signals as well. Right? Yes. And here's a, here's a better answer for you too. A lot of people think of technical analysis as its primary benefit is being its predictive power. And I mean, if you're really good, let's say you're a really good, good technical analyst. um, You can maybe have 60, 65% accuracy. That's about as good as it gets, no matter who you are. So really, I think of technical analysis is more about risk management and helping me to make if-then statements. So for example, with a triangle pattern, let's say you see a very clear, well-defined triangle pattern. And, and that's another tip. Don't try and force things onto your charts. Like if you're going to draw a horizontal support line, you know, it shouldn't cut through all kinds of price bars. You know, it should be obvious to everyone. If it's not obvious to everyone, it's not, it's not going to be valid. But for example, let's say you have a triangle pattern and your bias is up. You know that Triangle patterns tend to break in the direction of the prevailing trend, which let's assume it's up. You assume an upside breakout, but you can say if price breaks above the upper rail of that triangle pattern, then I will go long. If it breaks below the lower rail, I'm going to sit tight and wait for a new chart-based entry. So it allows you to make an if-then statement. You're not just saying, hey, there's a 60% chance it's going to break upwards. I'm just going to buy now. And then also working with those ratios that you mentioned to sort of figure out, is it cheap or is it expensive to sort of uh, manage that risk again? so that you don't buy when it's too expensive and you don't sell yeah. when it's too cheap. Exactly. Nice. And, a, and a lot, sorry, yeah, I didn't mean to cut you off there, but a lot, a lot of people like to scale in on weakness too, and they'll have pullback targets. I, you know, I wonder where they come up with the, these targets and you know, there's nothing wrong if it's just arbitrary, but like if you pull up a chart, you can find some clear support levels and then just maybe put your buy target just a few pennies above that. You know, it, that, that's just another way you can use charts. Yeah. Great. Well, you know what, right before I let you go here, uh, we, we've mentioned the silver chartist, uh, newsletter and in and, and your paid membership and, 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 and other things in this call a few times. But you also have a free service, which by the way is excellent. Um, so, you know, it only makes sense if you tell me the end of viewers a bit more about that. So well, what's, what's that all about, Steve? Oh, sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep it really brief. But we, we do a weekly um, report that goes out every Sunday. It's free. And you can get that. We put a link together just for your listeners, babysilverchartist.com. And um, it's a free weekly chart pack. Um, the goal is to provide tons of value for free. We don't spam you, hit you with high-pressure sales messages. Um, but once you become a free member, there is the opportunity if you choose to upgrade to a low-ticket premium service where you get a uh, fully transparent, over-the-shoulder service of ex- exactly what I'm doing in my own portfolio. I send out real-time alerts. We have company profiles. We have Jeff Clark on the team, one of the Doug Casey protégés. So uh, j- just a really good uh, premium service as well if, that, if you're into that. So babysilverchartist.com is a link just for your listeners if anyone wants to check that out. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I was a subscriber to the, the free one before, uh, before you invited me over to the paid one. And it's been really great. I mean, you're doing a, you're doing a great job. Uh, we also talked about, you know, you, you being different as a newsletter writer. So a uh, good job on that. And um, I hope you keep growing because you have a message to, to put out there and I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it, Antonio. Thank you for investing your time in me, Steve. Speak soon.